Welcome to this first aid CPD session on seizures and epilepsy. These sessions are designed to cover common first aid topics in more detail. They are aimed at anyone working in the first aid industry and first responders. My name is Chris and I will be guiding you through this first aid session. These videos are produced by Frontline Clinical Education, a clinical training consultancy. Let's begin. Epilepsy is a very common medical condition. It affects approximately 70 million people worldwide. In the United Kingdom, approximately 600,000 people have a diagnosis of epilepsy. According to Epilepsy Research UK, around 600 people receive a diagnosis of epilepsy each week. Patients with epilepsy are at risk of injuries from their seizures. In addition, Uncontrollable seizures, or a condition known as status epilepticus, can be life-threatening. Some patients with epilepsy are at an increased risk of sudden death, and it's also important to remember that there are significant psychosocial consequences of having a diagnosis of epilepsy. For example, there are restrictions on driving and certain occupations. Let's start off, though, by considering some definitions. So we can define a seizure as transient signs or symptoms which occur due to abnormal, excessive or synchronous neuronal activity in the brain. And we can simplify this definition by simply saying that a seizure is when patients develop signs or symptoms due to abnormal electrical activity in the brain. Moving on to think about epilepsy, there are several definitions of epilepsy, however, Quite simply, it's a neurological disorder in which a person experiences recurring seizures. And I've highlighted recurring here because that's a really important part of defining epilepsy. Patients need to have multiple seizures or have an increased risk of having a seizure. It's very important to remember that epilepsy results in seizures, but not all seizures are caused by epilepsy. And we're going to explore this in more detail later. The first thing that we should consider though is, is it even a seizure? Now it can be quite challenging to recognise a seizure in some clinical situations. Various other medical conditions and problems can cause signs and symptoms that can look quite similar to a seizure. If you have a sudden interruption in blood supply to the brain, and we call this hypoperfusion, that can result in a loss of consciousness and also cause jerking movements of the muscles. These can look very similar to seizures. We call these jerking movements myoclonic jerks. And these are simply the brain responding to a sudden interruption in blood supply and a sudden reduction in oxygen. So there are a couple of um, medical problems that can cause a sudden reduction in blood supply to the brain. Probably the most common that everyone knows about is a simple faint, or the medical language for this is a vasovagal syncope. Syncope just means a temporary loss of consciousness. Some patients who experience a faint may show these jerking movements, which can be mistaken for a seizure. Another cause of syncope, or loss of consciousness, is a problem with the heart, or cardiac causes. So this could be, for example, an abnormal heart rhythm. When the patient suddenly flips into this abnormal heart rhythm, they collapse to the floor and lose consciousness. The sudden interruption in blood supply to the brain causes, once again, these jerking movements that can look similar to a seizure. Finally, it's important to remember that a sudden cardiac arrest can also produce seizure-like activity in the seconds to short minutes following the cardiac arrest. In some cases, bystanders and first responders may not recognise that a cardiac arrest has occurred. Instead, they believe the patient has had a seizure. So how can we work out whether our patient is having a seizure or whether something else is going on? Well, here are some features that are more suggestive of a seizure occurring. Firstly, if the patient has bitten their tongue, and specifically if they've bitten the side of their tongue, then this suggests a generalised seizure. On examination, the patient may have a tongue laceration or bruising, and there may be blood in the mouth. Patients that bite the tip of their tongue are less likely to have had a seizure, 
These injuries can occur when patients fall and land on their chin and their face, which causes an injury to the tongue. The length of the episode is also important. In a seizure, there will be prolonged jerking and movements of the limbs, and this often lasts for several minutes. Whereas in other causes of loss of consciousness with seizure-like activity, for example, a syncopal event like a fainting episode or a sudden cardiac arrest, the jerking or movement of the limbs may only last for several seconds. Another important feature is whether there was a post-ictal period. So post-ictal just refers to abnormal or altered consciousness following a seizure. Typically patients can be quite drowsy and may be confused, and this can last for some time. If there was no post-ictal period and the patient recovered very quickly, then this is less likely to be a seizure. Finally, the presence of an aura is important. An aura is a collection of experiences that occur immediately before a seizure. Two examples of an aura are déjà vu and jamais vu. So we're probably familiar with déjà vu, which is the feeling that you've lived through the present situation before. Jamais vu is slightly different. This occurs when something happens which seems like it should be familiar, but isn't. So there's a feeling of unfamiliarity. Both of these auras can be more suggestive of a seizure. So hopefully this has helped you understand some of the features which are more suggestive of a seizure. Let's move on and consider some of the other causes of seizures. So as we said previously, remember that not all seizures are caused by epilepsy. And when dealing with these patients, you need to keep an open mind as to the cause of the seizure. I've put some common causes of seizures on this slide. A very common cause is withdrawal from alcohol or intoxication with drugs or alcohol. These patients can have multiple uncontrolled seizures and it can be life-threatening. Patients who have had a stroke and sustained damage to their brain, which has come on suddenly, can also present with a seizure. Trauma to the head or an injury inside the brain, such as a bleeding blood vessel, can also disrupt the electrical activity and cause a seizure. There are infective causes of seizures as well. If you have an infection affecting your central nervous system, which is your brain or your spinal cord, such as a meningitis, then this can also result in a seizure. Another very important um, cause of seizures to consider is low blood sugar. Significant hypoglycemia, can obviously cause the signs and symptoms of low blood sugar that we know about, but can also result in seizures, and this suggests that the blood sugar is really very low. It's very important, if you are trained, to always check a blood sugar level in a patient having a seizure. Some patients may have non-epileptic seizures, and this is called non-epileptic attack disorder. This is where patients have the signs and symptoms of a seizure, but the electrical activity in the brain is normal. So we've talked quite a lot about seizures. Let's talk a bit about epilepsy now. So the first thing to say is that epilepsy is a clinical diagnosis usually made by a specialist, such as a neurologist. In practice, diagnosing epilepsy can be a challenge, especially if there are no witnesses to the seizure events that occur. The International League Against Epilepsy defines epilepsy as at least two unprovoked seizures that occur more than 24 hours apart, or if you have one unprovoked seizure and then a high probability of having a second seizure, or if you have an epilepsy syndrome. A syndrome just refers to a collection of signs and symptoms. Epilepsy syndromes are a collection of signs and symptoms that include the features of epilepsy, so recurrent seizures. These syndromes are often inherited, maybe due to a genetic problem, and typically affect children. So this diagnosis can seem quite complicated. Don't worry about that. What I want you to appreciate is that epilepsy is quite a specialist diagnosis. Just because you have a single seizure doesn't mean that you will go on and develop epilepsy. In fact, studies suggest that the lifetime risk of us having a seizure is between 8 and 10%. 
so around 1 in 10 of us will have a seizure throughout our lifetime. However, there's only around a 3% risk of developing epilepsy over our lifetime, so the majority of people that have a single seizure won't go on to have a diagnosis of epilepsy. I hope this makes sense. Let's think a bit about the classification of seizures now. So broadly, we can split seizures into focal seizures and generalised seizures. Focal seizures originate in one half or hemisphere of the brain. They have a focal origin. Whereas generalised seizures originate in both sides of the brain, in both hemispheres. With focal seizures, you can further split them into whether the patient retains awareness during the episode or whether they have impaired awareness during the episode. With generalised seizures, you can split these into motor, so where there are motor signs and symptoms, such as limb jerking, or whether there are non-motor features, and this is the new term for absent seizures. Patients with generalised seizures tend to have impaired awareness. The International League Against Epilepsy have produced guidance on the classification of seizures, this is a simplified version of their classification system. We've already discussed the difference between focal seizures and generalised seizures. A common form of generalised seizures is the tonic-clonic motor seizure, and this is the traditional seizure that most people associate with epilepsy. So in the tonic phase, there's generalised muscular stiffening and patients fall to the floor. And in the clonic phase, there's rhythmical jerking of the limbs, often associated with tongue biting and maybe urinary incontinence. In some seizures, the onset is unknown, and in some cases, the seizure cannot be classified at all. Another thing to remember is that focal seizures can progress to generalised seizures. So this is where patients start off by having a focal seizure, but they then progress often to a tonic-clonic seizure. This is called secondary generalisation. If you wish to learn more about the classification of seizures, then you can visit the ILAE website, which has a full version of this guidance. Let's move on now to the management of seizures. So basic first aid measures are very important. Protecting the patient from any injury, Good airway management and placing patients into the recovery position following the seizure is also important. Remember, a tongue laceration may have caused bleeding into the mouth and the throat, which could cause an airway problem. Patients can also have dysfunctional breathing during tonic-clonic seizures especially, and they may become very hypoxic. The first-line drug treatment in the community is buccal midazolam. Midazolam is a short-acting benzodiazepine, and this is administered into the buccal cavity, so between the lower gum and the teeth. It works to terminate seizure activity by disrupting the abnormal electrical activity in the brain. The dose does depend on age or weight, but in adults it's often 10 milligrams. Buccal midazolam is often prescribed to patients who have recurrent seizures, and their carers or parents are trained in how to use it. Another drug you may see being used is rectal diazepam. Diazepam is just a different form of benzodiazepine that can be administered rectally. Both of these drugs, buccal midazolam and rectal diazepam, mean that intravenous access isn't required in order to administer the benzodiazepine, and this can be very useful in a community setting. Finally, Remember to always keep a broad and open mind about the cause of the seizure. Don't always assume a seizure is due to epilepsy. It's important to consider other possible causes, for example a head injury or low blood sugar, as we've discussed previously. Here's just an example of a common brand of buccal midazolam. As you can see, it comes in different doses, and they, it comes prepared in pre-filled syringes, to make it easy to administer in an emergency setting. So at the beginning of this presentation, we mentioned that status epilepticus was a complication of epilepsy or seizures. Let's have a look at this in more detail. 
so we can define status epilepticus as a prolonged convulsive seizure lasting for five minutes or longer, or where a patient has recurrent seizures one after the other without recovery in between. So this definition has changed slightly. There's a move now to think about status epilepticus um, with a five minute time limit. Older definitions referred to a 30 minute time limit. An important point I want to make is that patients can develop status epilepticus without a diagnosis of epilepsy. And in fact, a very common cause of status epilepticus is in patients who have alcohol-related seizures, for example, due to alcohol withdrawal. So you don't need a diagnosis of epilepsy to have status epilepticus. If untreated, it has a high mortality rate of approximately 30%, and this is a medical emergency. The first line treatment for status epilepticus is to give benzodiazepines. In hospital, we would often give intravenous lorazepam. If this is ineffective, other intravenous drugs can be tried. If the patient does not respond to this, then we would involve our anaesthetic and critical care colleagues to think about admission to intensive care. Another complication of epilepsy is sudden death. And this has been termed SUDEP, or Sudden Unexplained Death in Epilepsy. And this occurs when a person with epilepsy dies suddenly and prematurely, and no reason for the death is found. Many of these deaths occur at night. There are certain risk factors that put patients at an increased risk of this. So for example, if they have seizures at night, which we call nocturnal seizures. If they have poorly controlled epilepsy, and patients who have generalised tonic-clonic seizures are more at risk. And the level of risk depends on the number of seizures. So the more seizures you have, the more at risk you are of sudden death. According to SUDEP Action, which is an epilepsy death charity in the UK, there are around three epilepsy-related deaths every day in the United Kingdom. You can learn more about SUDEP on their website, which is sudep.org. So in summary, epilepsy is a common neurological disorder which affects millions of people worldwide. Remember, however, that not all seizures are due to epilepsy and keep an open mind when assessing these patients. Don't ever forget to check a glucose level if you are trained to do so. And finally, status epilepticus is a life-threatening emergency and don't delay in seeking emergency medical help. So thank you for listening to this first aid CPD session. If you've got any questions, comments or ideas for collaboration, you can contact me on the email address here. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel to be informed when we upload new videos. Thank you.